passage before us is a long one, but what better way can we spend our time than reading a significant block of Holy Scripture? John chapter 11, and I will read verses 1 to 53. John chapter 11, 1 to 53. I hope you'll follow along. There are parts of this message that will make a lot more sense if you can jump around in the text with me as we follow the line of thought. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you are going back? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now, Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed her quickly, how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. 
Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and his feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing? They asked. Here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. Then one of them named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own. But as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. And not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. This is the word of the Lord. So often God surprises us. Moses thought so. As a young man, he thought he'd bring about revolution. He ended up on the backside of a desert for the next half century or so. And finally, when God called him, Moses was already 80 years old. Time to retire and slow down. Besides, Moses didn't uh, have any gift of speech. He wasn't comfortable. It was a bit surprising that God would call in an 80-year-old. Mind you, I have more and more sympathy for 80-year-olds, I have to say. <laughs> Habakkuk thought it was a bit surprising, too. God is surprising. He could understand how God could use a regional superpower to chase in his covenant people because of their idolatry. What he didn't understand was how God could use a regional superpower which on every graph was socially more corrupt, was morally more corroded, was more violent, was more destitute of grace and godliness than the Israelite people that they were sent to chasten. How could God do that? Paul thought that God was a bit surprising. I mean, he could pray for people and they would be healed. He, he saw the hand of God's power in the alleviation of illness. Now he has this thorn in the flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment him, and he prays and God says, I'm not going to do it. I'll give you grace instead, which initially didn't satisfy Paul at all. He prayed diligently, setting aside repeated times for intercessory prayer until Paul learned my grace is sufficient for you. So often God surprises us. And then, of course, there's Abraham, promised this son who finally showed up, and then God tells Abraham to slaughter him. But one of the things that is most striking about the gospel is that at its heart, it is a gospel of surprises. Who amongst the apostles anticipated that God would redeem his people by sending his son to die for them by taking their place? Who expected Jesus to rise from the dead? 
not the women who went to the grave. They had ointment to pour on his body. Not the apostles. They were busy hiding in an upstairs room. They weren't saying, yes, I could hardly wait till Sunday. They were scared they were going to be arrested and crucified themselves. The gospel is the gospel of surprise. And despite all of the passages from the Old Testament scriptures that anticipate the coming of a Messiah who would be a servant, slaughtered lamb, glorious king, a triumphant conqueror, and a bleeding sacrifice. Despite all the scriptures that talk along these lines, many of them using typology rather than mere verbal prediction to point in that direction, the truth of the matter is it wasn't by and large picked up, which is why when Jesus walks with the two on the Emmaus road after the resurrection, he, he can rebuke them and say, oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have written. Ought not Christ to have suffered? fact remains, it was a surprise. So when we come to this passage where Jesus demonstrates that he is himself the resurrection and the life, the passage is marked by surprise after surprise after surprise until we come to the greatest gospel surprise of all. Number one. Jesus hears a desperate plea for help and demonstrates his love by delay. Verses 1 to 16. We're introduced to Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. I love the description, Lord, the one you love is sick. H have you noticed this even in a church with a good pastor? that just about everybody in the church thinks they're the pastor's special friend. They, 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 they feel loved. And that's true in largely, larger familial relationships as well. One of the remarkable things about John's gospel is that the evangelist simply calls himself the one who Jesus loved. That does not mean, ah, he loves me more than you. Ah. It's just that he feels so loved himself that that's the way he likes to designate himself, the one whom Jesus loved. And there are the sisters referring to their brother Lazarus who is ill. Uh, Lord, the one you love is ill. Isn't it a wonderful thing? We should go around our relationships and our familial responsibilities and think of ourselves as the one whom Jesus loved. Isn't that what Paul prays for in Ephesians chapter 3? That you might have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of God, to know this love that surpasses knowledge, so that you might be filled with all the measure of the fullness of God. In other words, that you might be mature. The implication is you can't be mature unless you experience for yourself more and more fully that you are loved by God. It's already being picked up in Jesus' personal, earthly relationships. The one whom you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, verse 4, this sickness will not end in death. Well, it won't end in death. It will go through death on the way. No, it is for God's glory, not in order that God may receive glory, that's not the idea here, but that God's glory may be displayed. This is for the display of God's glory in displaying the glory of Christ as he raises him from the dead. That's why this man is so sick. Verse 6, so, it's a strong word, therefore, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. How do you like that for a demonstration of love? Oh, I sure love my disciple Lazarus. So when I hear that he's deathly ill, I hang around two more days before I set out to help him. That's what the text says. And in fact, the timing is 
underscored again and again and again in the narrative. He waits two days, we're told. And then, after two days, he says, let's go back to Judea. And it turns out in the following conversation that Jesus has come to know supernaturally that Lazarus, meanwhile, has died. So he hears that Lazarus is sick, waits two days, knows that Lazarus has died, and then wants to go back south, about a three-day, three-and-a-half-day walk. After Jesus arrived, verse 17, he discovered that Lazarus has been in the tomb for four days. So if he had set out immediately, Lazarus still would have been dead. He would have been dead for two days. Why wait for two more days? Dead is still dead. But the significance of the four days is stressed again and again in the book. For example, down in verse 35, Lord, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. We forget what burials were like in hot countries where the custom was to bury the deceased within the first 24 hours. There was no embalming unless you came from extravagantly wealthy homes, and then it would be a process that could take months. He, he was dead and buried and was decomposing enough that, as the King James Version memorably puts it by this time, he stinketh. <laughs> but because there was no embalming and no medical practitioners of the contemporary sort that are needed to declare a person dead today, occasionally what happened was the heart started fibrillating. The breathing was so shallow that you couldn't even detect it. And there were reports of people being carried out in their caskets to the grave when suddenly as they're being carried out, you're tick, 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 tick. The body inside is uh, resuscitated. This led to a number of Jewish theories. For example, in one first century document, we read, when a person apparently dies, the soul hovers over the body of the deceased person for the first three days, quote, intending to re-enter it, but as soon as it sees that the appearance changes, that is, when decomposition has set in irreversibly, then it departs. Now, I'm not suggesting Jesus is buying into that, but he knew jolly well that if he had healed Lazarus or apparently raised him from the dead after only two days, some people in the crowd would have said, uh-huh, just two days, spirit still hovering around. Impressive, but not that impressive. But four days, and by this time he stinketh, Jesus loved Lazarus and Mary and Martha. Therefore, he waited two days. And in waiting two days, he established such spectacular certainty of Lazarus' death that when he raised him from the dead, no one could say anything slanderous or cynical or skeptical. I am glad that I was not there, Jesus said, for your sake, so that you would believe, you would believe that I really do have the power to raise people genuinely from the dead without any spooky stories of delayed spirit departures and that sort of thing. Jesus demonstrates his love, in this case, by delay. And that is often the case. It's the child who lives in the immediate now. Our son, when he was uh, three years old, three and a half years old, had a voracious appetite of a teenager. My wife 
runs by ordered schedules. And as we got close to the next mealtime, uh, she wouldn't start passing out treats to stave off hunger. It'll spoil your appetite. I, I personally never thought you could spoil Nicholas's appetite, but that's another matter. But he became her little shadow. And finally she would turn around and say, Nick, Nicholas, it's, it's only 10 minutes, just go away. It'll be ready in 10 minutes. But his attitude was, now, now, I'm hungry now. And similarly, that's the way we want our blessings from God. Now, I, I need it now. And sometimes God expresses his love instead by delay. And by this means, he teaches us such things as perseverance and faithfulness, what's transcendentally important. Don't we read, for example, in Romans 5? We glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. James 1 makes much the same argument. God sometimes displays his love toward us in delay. You fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds you so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessing on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his works in vain. God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain. So here's the first surprise. Jesus hears a desperate plea for help and demonstrates his love by delay. Number two. Jesus comes up against devastating loss and consoles grief by directing attention to himself. Verses 17 to 27. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was two miles outside of Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them. Now, you must understand how this comfort takes place. In a lot of Anglo-Saxon cultures, you demonstrate your Christian maturity at funerals and the like by a kind of stiff upper lip. You watch a widow or a widower at a funeral and maybe a tear or two escapes, and, but it's, it's all rather disciplined and sedate. And, and afterwards, you summarize it by saying, um, um, he, she was very strong, you know. Whereas in many cultures, it doesn't work like that. The way you demonstrate your tears, your grief, your, your godly sorrow is, is by wailing and crying. In fact, in the first century Judaism, you made sure that you hired a professional wailing woman to help. If tears were drying up a wee bit and there was not enough crying, she would start blubbering and the, granted the sensitivity of everybody's feelings, pretty soon the whole crowd would join in. And they would often hire professional musicians to pray, play dirge music. Uh, at, at, at very least, uh, even in a poor family, you were supposed to have two flautists playing dirge music. This was a wealthy family. So maybe they had an whole orchestra playing dirge music. And now they've come from Jerusalem to comfort Mary and Martha. We'll see how they do so in a few moments. They comfort them by providing the background to encourage wailing and gnashing of teeth. When Martha had gone out, always the activist, to meet Jesus, Mary stayed at home. And now in verse 21, Martha finally falls, finds Jesus and falls at his feet. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, you could read that cynically. And... Imagine that Martha is blaming Jesus. It's your fault. If you'd been here where you should have been, you would have been able to heal him when he was sick. He wouldn't have died if you'd been here. Why were you away? Don't you love us after all? But that's just too cynical. It's too cynical by half. And 
Martha herself realizes that she could sound like that, so she adds immediately, verse 22, but I, 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 I know that even now God will give you whatever you want. But you mustn't think that this means she was therefore expecting her brother to be raised from the dead immediately. That she is not expecting it is very clear for even when Jesus gets to the tomb later in the chapter, verse 38, she protests that the stone should not be taken away. It's too late. By this time, my, my brother is emitting a bad odor. She's not expecting a miracle at this stage. She's merely trying to say, I'm not really blaming you, Jesus. I, 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 I know that you're wonderful. I know that God will give you what you ask him. Jesus answered and said, your brother will rise again. Spectacularly ambiguous. She responds at the level of good Jewish conservative orthodoxy. I know, Lord, there is a resurrection at the end of the age. My brother will rise then. She's orthodox. But it could be understood your brother will rise again in the next few minutes. She doesn't pick up any of that possibility. And then Jesus says the most important words in the entire chapter. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Now, the thing to see initially before we look at these words closely is what Jesus does not say. He does not say, oh, you poor woman, let me give you a hug. I'm praying for you. You know, God still cares and loves, for us, loves us. What he does is direct attention to himself. It's not enough to get her to confess orthodoxy. Oh, yeah, he's going to be raised on the last day. Death, death is the last enemy. It does not have the last word. Yes, yes, I, I, I know that. He, he goes way beyond that. He points to himself. I am the resurrection. I am the life. Do you believe this? Earlier in this gospel, Jesus has spoken of the resurrection that takes place in the last day and of his authority within it. For example, John 5, 21. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. That sort of claim is made several times in chapters 5 and 6. And now Jesus says it, a bit more poetically, I am the resurrection and the life. There are two claims. I am the resurrection and I am the life. And what he means by each is unpacked in the following words. I am the resurrection. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Death does not have the last word. And I am the life. Whoever lives by believing in me will never die. That life begins now and in the deepest, most eternal sense in terms of connection to the living God who gives life. You will never, ever die. You have eternal life. Now I am the resurrection and the life. In one of the bloody revolutions that mark the history of modern France, France at the time of the Fourth Republic was in chaotic disrepair and it was not at all clear that it would escape civil war. And Charles de Gaulle was asked by some newspaper people, where is the state now? And he said simply, l'état, c'est moi. Je suis l'état, I am the state. Now, of course, at an ontological level, that doesn't make any sense at all. He's not the state, he's just a man, he's gonna die. But the state was so bound up with de Gaulle and his authority at that time that you understood exactly what he was saying. Let me try another example. The first fast food chain that developed here in North America was not McDonald's. The big, first big one was Kentucky Fried Chicken. And everywhere there were pictures of Colonel Saunders and his finger licking good secret recipe of 11 herbs and spices and so on. So you could imagine that at some point in the advertising, now I never heard this, but you could imagine at some point in the advertising, 
Colonel Saunders saying, I am Kentucky Fried Chicken. That would not be an ontological claim. He wasn't a chicken, Kentucky Fried or otherwise. <laughs> but you, want, you could understand what he meant. It was, it was, he was so much tied up with Kentucky Fried Chicken that, that without, without him, without his chain, without his restaurants, without his finger-licking good secret recipe of herbs and spices, there was no Kentucky Fried Chicken. All the rest was phony. I am Kentucky Fried Chicken. That's the kind of thing Jesus is saying. He's not making an ontological claim. He is saying, in effect, I am the resurrection of the dead. I am life. There is no resurrection and from, from, from the dead. There is no eternal life whatsoever apart from me. I am the resurrection and the life. He's focusing all the attention on himself. Do you believe this? It's one thing, Martha, for you to believe that there is a resurrection at the end of the age. You're in line with orthodoxy in Jewish circles, but do you believe that I am the resurrection and the life? And if she answers positively, then the miracle that takes place is almost a kind of acted parable of what will be at the end of the age. He is not asking her if she believes that he is about to raise her brother from the dead immediately. But if her faith that there will be a resurrection at the end can extend to deep trust in Jesus as the only one who grants eternal life now and will resurrect the dead on the last day. In short, if he can trust him as the resurrection and the life. And if she answers positively, then the raising of Lazarus, as I've said, becomes a kind of acted parable of the life-giving power of Jesus anticipating the end. Hence, verse 27, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Her reply carries the narrative forward, for clearly she believes that the one who is the resurrection and the life must be such by virtue of the fact that he is himself the promised Messiah. But the surprise in all of this, from the point of view of modern help and counseling and grief counseling and so on, is, is how much of it we find Jesus pointing simply to himself. In fact, when you stop to think of it, that's what he's doing constantly in the Gospels. He, he points people to himself. C consider, when John the Baptist points out who Jesus is, he says, humbly, he must increase, but I must decrease. I'm not worthy that he should loosen even my sandals. Uh, he's the bridegroom, I'm just the best man. There's no comparison. I'm not the Messiah. It's not false humility. He's just telling the truth. But in Matthew chapter 11 and Luke chapter 7, when Jesus bears testimony to John the Baptist, far from saying, you know, he's a pretty great preacher and I tried to follow in his train. There's no sort of mutual humility, each side trying to be more humble than the other side. What he says is, um, I, I, I tell you the truth, um, John the Baptist is the greatest man born of woman because he introduced me. Now, supposing Tim had sat down after introducing me tonight, this, this noon, and, and, uh, and, and then I got up and said, listen up, folks, I'm telling you the truth. Tim Keller is the greatest man born a woman because he just introduced me. <laughs> but that's exactly what Jesus says. He, 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 is, he is the Elijah who was to come, the one who announces the way of the Lord, who, who points out who Jesus is. Oh, there is a sense in which, in which Abraham points out who Jesus is, and Moses points out who Jesus is, and David points out who Jesus is, and, and Esther points out who Jesus is. There is a sense in which all of these things, these people, their, their institutions, their places in history point forward to who Jesus is. That's, that's all true. But it fell on one man, John the Baptist, to say, there. That's the promised Messiah. I have come to prepare the way for the Lord. He is the one. And Jesus gets up and says, that's what makes him the greatest man who ever lived, because he introduced me. There is such a spectacular, self-conscious awareness of who he is in Jesus' mind and words 
that it makes no sense whatsoever to view him as merely one more of a type, one more of a breed, one more prophet. So yes, God spoke to the ancestors by the prophets at many times and in many ways, but in these last days, he has given us the Son revelation. There's a wonderful pair of lines at the end of chapter 10 of John's Gospel. Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. There he stayed and many people came to him. They said, though John never performed a sign, all that John said about this man was true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. You who are preachers of the word of God, how would you like that as your epitaph? Don Carson never performed a miracle, but everything that he said about Jesus was true. John was the greatest of all those born of women up to that point because he pointed out who Jesus is. And in this passage, Jesus brings comfort to a lonely, battered, grieving sister. Not by talking in abstract terms about life and death or in eschatological terms about final resurrection, but by pointing her to himself. I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? And in the comfort we give to Christians going through hard times or facing bereavement and loss, that's where our focus must be, pointing always, always, always to Jesus, to Jesus, to Jesus. Third, Jesus comes up against implacable death and displays his sovereignty over it by tears and outrage. More surprise. Verses 28 to 44. Jesus apparently stays outside the town, Bethlehem, not because of some desire for anonymity, but he's letting the mourning take place and his disciples themselves are trying to protect him. He knows that he's in danger from the authorities. But Martha goes back and calls Mary, and Mary joins Jesus. But this time, the crowd observes Mary leaving. The teacher is here and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now, Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When she approaches Jesus, she uses exactly the same words that her sister Martha had used. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Probably they had talked about that together, and that was the conclusion at which they had arrived. But now the conversation goes in a very different direction. Because this is not a private interview between Jesus and Martha, and now Jesus and Mary. Rather, the crowd is there. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was, well, our English translations all have some form of deeply moved in spirit and troubled. I don't know why, because it's simply not what the original says. Interestingly enough, in this case, the German translations, all of them, have it right. The English translations have it wrong. The verb that is used, deeply moved, does not suggest simply depth of emotion or the like. A better translation would be something like, he was outraged and troubled. And then again, verse 38, Jesus once more outraged came to the tomb. You see, we notice the tears in verse 35, Jesus wept. And we automatically think in terms of the tears we shed at our funerals. And we, we say Jesus wept because of the loss of his friend. Really? Jesus knows that in three minutes or so, Lazarus is going to come forth. It sounds like crocodile tears to me. 
if the reason for the tears is because he's missing his friend. He's only got three more minutes to go. No, 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 no. He's deeply outraged and troubled and weeps. Why? But the, the narrative tells us. He, he sees Mary weeping and the Jews who come along with him also weeping. And this is a lot of noise. Culturally, this demands cries and outbursts and orchestral dirges. More tears, more weeping. And Jesus is outraged. For what he sees is death, the last enemy. It is outrageous. We have domesticated death so much in our culture. The experts come in and take away the bodies, and then they're embalmed, and everything is played with soft music at a, at a, at a funeral hall. And it, it, it's all domesticated. But it's not the way it is in many cultures around the world where death is desperate. It's for, not for nothing that the apostle Paul insists that death still remains the last enemy. No, it does not have the last, it, it does have the last, it is the last enemy. We ought to be outraged by it. We lay our spouses in the tomb. We bury our babies. We bury elderly parents. And of course, there's part of us that remembers with a certain kind of joy that death does not have the last word and this aged mother, my mother, who died after nine years of Alzheimer's and couldn't recognize any of her children, she wakes up in glory and she's in the presence of Christ. And one day she will be raised from the dead in bodily form as well, in the new heaven and the new earth, a home of righteousness. Of, of course that's glorious, but it doesn't detract from the tragedy, the ugliness of Alzheimer's and death and sorrow and bereavement. And all of that, as was eloquently put in the last address, all of that because of sin. Jesus sees sin and the tears and the death, and the loss, and he is outraged and troubled and weeps. These are tears of the same sort when Jesus pronounces his woes upon the city of Jerusalem and at the end of the chapter, weeps. Compassion, yes, but outrage. There is a sense in which we ought not to domesticate death by so emphasizing what comes after death for Christians that we fail to see how ugly this thing is. It is appointed unto all of us once to die, and after that, the judgment. There's no escaping it. And it's the fruit of sin. It is inevitable, it is unavoidable, and it is ugly. So he confronts implacable death and sovereignly addresses it as we'll see but with tears of outrage some people want to focus all the attention on the fact that Lazarus is finally resurrected from the grave, and we wonder what he was thinking about. He's been there and come back. Why don't we hear anything about that side of things? Alfred Lord Tennyson wrote a poem called In Memoriam that tries to imagine why there's silence on these matters. Behold a man raised up by Christ, the rest remaineth unrevealed. He told it not, or something sealed the lips of the evangelist. What does the evangelist portray? Jesus outraged, saying, take away the stone. But Lord, there's a bad odor. Take away the stone. Didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God, that is, the display of God's glory manifest now in what I do? So they took away the stone. 
And Jesus prays. He prays understanding that this prayer is a public prayer and therefore it needs to be worded a certain way. Public prayers are not to be shaped exactly the same way as private prayers because although you may be addressing God, you know that people are listening in and they are learning something from it. Hence, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here that they may believe that you sent me. This is part of the display of the glory of God in Christ Jesus. Then when he had said this, he called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Some wag has observed that if Jesus hadn't prefixed his command with the name Lazarus, every tomb in Jerusalem would have spit out its dead. The dead man came out, hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. That's where the focus is, not on what was passing through Lazarus's mind. Was he saying, nice to see you, sis? Or, oh, good grief, have I got to come back here? We're not introduced to any of that. It's, it's secondary, it's not important. What's important is the manifestation of the glory of God in Christ Jesus, even over sin and death, the glory of God displayed. And finally, the greatest surprise of all, Jesus comes up against moral and spiritual death and gives life by dying himself. The crowds respond predictably. Some believe Jesus when they perceive the miracle, how genuine their faith is. The text doesn't explore at all. But some of them simply go and rat him out to the Pharisees. Verse 46, see what trouble they can stir up. And this generates a meeting of the Sanhedrin trying to see a way out of the conundrum in front of them. What, what, what do we do with this chap? He's pulling in such great numbers that, that eventually the Roman authority, the overlord, the vassal state bows to the dictates of the regional superpower. Surely there is a danger. They'll send in the troops and mow people down. They're taking away our temple, they're taking away our place, they're, t they're taking away our privileged status, all because this chap is drawing big religious crowds. It, it looks like an insurrection. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. So Caiaphas speaks. The language he uses is condescending. You bunch of nincompoops. You know nothing at all. You ignoramuses. Don't you realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish? This is real politik. It's brutal expediency. No concern for justice or truth. No reflection on what might be properly concluded from the fact, the well-established fact with lots of witnesses that Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. No reconsideration of their assessment of Jesus. No worship, no adoration. It's all politics. What he proposes is a substitutionary death. Better for you that one man die, however unjustly, than that the nation should perish. And of course, the deep irony, as anybody who reads this book knows, is that in another 40 years, the nation would perish. Jerusalem would be crushed. The temple would be destroyed. And the death of Jesus from that political perspective was all for nothing. But John sees something deeper. He comments, Caiaphas did not speak on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied. Born along by the Spirit of God, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. Well, that's exactly what Caiaphas had said. It's not that God, by his spirit, was using Caiaphas the way God spoke through Balaam's ass. When Balaam's ass gave his counsel to the prophet, Balaam's ass was not giving its considered opinion. It was empowered to speak by the miraculous display of God's power. That's it. But Caiaphas was giving his opinion, and he was speaking of a substitutionary sacrifice. 
He just got the directions all wrong. He thought of a sacrifice in which one man would take the place of the nation in the physical arena to stave off a political coup. But as often in John's gospel, sometimes people speak better than they know. He bore the death of his people, not only the Jewish people, but of the scattered children of God, whose death would be sucked up, born, exhausted in Jesus' own death. He died as a substitute for them. Jesus comes up against moral and spiritual death and gives life by dying himself. One of the briefest forms in which this is expressed in the history of the church is a little four-line poem. He death in death laid low. Made sin, he sin or threw. Bow to the grave, destroyed it so and death by dying slew. We live this side of the cross. This is so elementary and fundamental a part of our Christian confessionalism. We can't confess Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God, without embracing within that confession the truth that Jesus died for our sins and rose again. He is the resurrection and the life. But when these words were first spoken, not even the apostles had a very good understanding. When Peter confesses that Jesus is the Messiah, he doesn't include in his confession that this Messiah must die. For when Jesus goes on to talk about his impending death, he says, get never, Lord, this shall never happen to you, earning him the immortal rebuke, get behind me, Satan, you do not understand the things of God. That does not mean that Peter was overtaken by demon possession and it wasn't really Peter speaking, it was really the devil himself. Peter was giving his own considered view, just as Caiaphas was giving his own view. But when Peter spoke, he was serving as the devil's mouthpiece. When Caiaphas spoke, in God's great providence, to everyone's surprise, he was serving as God's mouthpiece. And suddenly the strands of Old Testament line and thought come together. Why all those sacrifices on the Day of Atonement on Yom Kippurim, year after year, year after year after year? Why the slaughter of the Passover lamb that turns away the wrath of God year after year after year after year? Why all this death? Why, why the picture of, of approaching God through a, a mediating priest once a year under God's prescription on Yom Kippur to, to bring the blood of, of atonement both for the sins of the priest and for the sins of the people and splatter it upon the top of the Ark of the Covenant. Why all this? Where does it end up? Where does it go? The fact of the matter is people didn't guess where it went because they didn't have a big enough category for God. They couldn't imagine that God would reconcile people to himself by this means, even though all the images were there, all the prophecies were there. They, they didn't see it. They didn't see it. The gospel itself came as a spectacular surprise. And even while we confess the truth that Christ died in our place, Christ rose from the dead, and that is elementary confessionalism for us today, there are still Millions of people who have heard these truths and don't believe them. And then when by the Spirit they are enabled to see, the surprise is gone. And they see and believe. No wonder Peter can talk about Old Testament saints striving to understand the nature of the prophecies that they were writing when, when the Holy Scriptures spoke of the sufferings of Christ and the things that would follow. We are so, so privileged, brothers and sisters in Christ, to live this side of Calvary and the empty tomb. 
we see. And it is elementary Christian proclamation that announces this news again and again and again in our generation in the earnest hope and expectation that God, by the proclamation of the gospel, will enable others to see and believe. Let us pray. Even angels desire to look into these things. O oh Lord God, have mercy upon us that we may plumb the depths of your grace as disclosed in Holy Scripture and be eager not unto, only to understand and believe but to proclaim this good news to a needy, lost, broken world. For Jesus' sake, amen.